Recently, The Atlantic wrote a profile of a woman that was referred to as the bearded lady in the 1800s. And the reason why this story is relevant today is because of the way people treated her even though she was a, literally a woman with a beard. Now, P.T. Barnum actually worked with her uh, and toured her throughout the country uh, and throughout the world in order to make a business out of her. But the way people treated her was interesting. Now, P.T. Barnum, I didn't know this, made a living off of controversy. So the whole point was to do things that people might think is a scam. So he was hoping that people would think that this woman is actually a man dressed as a woman and then they would accuse him of a scam and then that would lead to controversy and more and more people would come to see her. But that's actually not what happened. People listened to her and they believed her and they actually respected her. And it kind of shows you a little bit of a contrast between the 1800s and today. In some ways we've kind of regressed. Wow, that's interesting. In some ways we're identical. A guy who uh, feeds off of controversy and gets bigger and bigger because of it. Kind of sounds like Donald Trump. Yeah, that's that's a good point. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me tell you about uh, who was referred to as the bearded lady. Um, her real name, or what she was referred to, was Lady Clofulia. Okay, as she toured America in the 1850s, Clofulia's audience saw a mere curiosity, not a crime against gender, that was billed. Only rarely, in fact, did they claim that Madame Clofulia's beard compromised her womanhood or made her look like a man. Isn't that amazing? God, there is so much more open-minded than we are. That's insane. This is the 1800s. We've gone backwards. Okay, so let me just note for the record, though, that aside from the fact that she had a beard, she was a very, you know, stereotypical woman. And what I mean by that... Anatomically... Not even, not even anatomically. It, it, in terms of her personality, she played the role of a woman so well that people were like, yeah, yeah. That's a woman. She's mm -hmm. she's the ultimate feminine woman. She likes to do things like knit. She she's genteel. Like they would refer to her as you know a very a woman's woman. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let me give you more. The public seemingly accepted that Clofulia was was what she presented herself to be a genteel woman with a beard. While a handful of viewers uh, trickled into the American Museum, the bearded lady had distressingly failed to provoke cries of fraud. In fact, one person wrote about her, saw this lady, father and husband in Zanesville, 1854, very intelligent, respectable looking people. I think that we've regressed in certain ways in the sense that we have no empathy for people that are different. I feel like back in the day, there seemed to be more empathy. They looked at her and they're like, oh, well, it's kind of unfortunate, but it doesn't change who she is as a person. Today, we're so obsessed with the superficial stuff, right? Look, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not trying to make the 1800s seem like they were all hunky-dory. I'm sure that there were yeah. people out there that were terrible to her. But the open-mindedness is interesting because I don't see that same open-mindedness now. Like if someone is different or if someone has some sort of genetic disorder that makes them, you know, unique, they get put down, they get made fun of, and that becomes their identity. That's their only identity. People don't look at their personality. They become a phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, so, well now, of course, 1800s cut in both ways. Obviously, there were some people that were looked upon as very different. They were called slaves. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, the discrimination that happened there was historic and unbelievable, right? Now, on the other hand, uh, people might have been more uh, understanding within their race because uh, around that time, uh, classic beauty, especially in the 1700s, uh, but also going into the 1800s, uh, the number one indicator of whether a woman was beautiful was whether she had all her teeth. So if most of the women are missing a good deal of teeth, maybe like things like this don't freak them out as much. Whereas now we're so obsessed with perfected beauty, mm -hmm. which isn't even real. The photoshopping and the this and the that and the unreal waist, the hip ratio, mm -hmm. and everybody's got to look like a cartoon character. So this level of imperfection for us is like, oh my God, sound the alarms, what has happened? Yeah, that's a good point. It's You, you think of the 1800s, I know this sounds ridiculous, but when I think of the 1800s, I think of what you see in movies, right? Those insanely beautiful, like, cherubic, is that what they say? Yeah, women. Yeah, yeah. the younger ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, 
You're right. I mean, they didn't have the same medical advancements. They didn't have plastic surgery. They didn't have dentistry to the extent that we have it today. Oh, no, no. So all those movies about, you know, Britain in the past or the French, it's, 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 and they're fanning themselves. Yeah. And they all have blush cheeks and yes. look lovely. No, in the real, they should, somebody should do a real version of that where they have no front teeth and it's, the whole thing's a disaster. And there's no air conditioning. Oh my God! And then no, no one would ever want to travel back in time. There's like flimsy beauty products. There's no skinceuticals back in there's the day. There's no Michelle Fan back then. How do you even know how to do makeup? <laughs> <laughs> but hey, you know what? One of the positive effects was, at least within your race, they were a little bit more understanding of one another. Yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> okay. All we right. found the silver lining. We found it.